Welcome everyone. Good morning. Good morning to all those who have braved the intrepid weather here and come out on this Earth Day. All those who are gathered in this sanctuary and those who are joining us online. We're so glad to have you here. And now we're going to begin our service with a special performance of We Have Just One World by the Green Grannies. You're invited to join in singing the song and the lyrics will be on the screen.
Thank you, Green Grannies. What a delight. Woo! <laughs> Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Charlottesville. My name is Reverend Susan Carlson. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm pleased to be weaving worship this morning with Kim Grover and Ellie Siverud from our UC, UUCville Ministry for the Earth with music director Scott DeVoe, soloist Georgina Todd, and of course, the Green Grannies. This sanctuary was built over 70 years ago on the homeland of the Monacan people and was once cared for by enslaved people from Africa and their descendants. We honor all who have dwelt here and all in our congregation whose lives led to this moment of our gathering. I invite us now to take a moment to greet others. Those online may unmute and say hello, and those here in the sanctuary or social hall are welcome to greet your neighbors, especially those you may not know. Good morning. Good morning, Hi. everyone. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And, and um, I'm in uh, morning. We are very proud to see the green grannies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, Linda, Linda Duke, you're here. Hi. Linda. <laughs> We're here from outside of uh, Mancos, Colorado, on a on a ranch. Nobody around us for miles. Except elk. Much is of it. <laughs> what are you making, Sally? Uh, it's just another hat. <laughs> Endless lake hats. <laughs> that's pretty magical you know you just sound a chime and there's more silence incredible we offer a special welcome to newcomers and invite you to join us for fellowship after the service in the social home please feel free to use one of our red coffee mugs which are for newcomers and UUCville members and friends are reminded to offer a warm welcome to anyone with a red mug. We also invite newcomers to stop by the connections table near the monitor in the social hall to learn more about us. Seating is also available in the social hall where there is a live stream of service, of the service, and everyone is welcome in the sanctuary, but if you need a roomier space, just a little extra room to spread out, the social hall can be a good alternative. Many thanks to all the folks helping us share worship both here and online, our greeters, our ushers on hospitality and logistics team, and special thanks as always to our AV tech, Rachel Buckland, supporting the dual platform worship both online and here on Rugby Road. And now we have greetings from our board member, John Griffith. Good morning. Is this on? Good morning. All right. <laughs> I'm John Griffith, and I'm bringing greetings from the board. Um, and uh, I have exciting news. Next Sunday, after the service, there's going to be a session here, uh, both virtual and online, to uh, look at a draft of the long-range plan. It's what we've been working on over the last year ish and uh you know the eventual goal is to vote on that in at the annual meeting in june um we have talked to lots of people in different groups have lots of ideas and really trying to condense that into things that can be done and achieved over the next three years um, so this is an important opportunity for everyone to provide some feedback and i look forward to seeing all of you next week at that session thank you
under our announcements, which we have a few of this morning. Today, following this service, there will be a sustainable eating potluck in the social hall and a native plant seed giveaway with seeds from our own native plant garden. Thanks to all who brought vegan or vegetarian dishes. Please know that everyone's invited to enjoy the delicious food, even if you weren't able to bring a dish to share. And also, a special dessert table is being hosted by the Pledge Drive team in appreciation for all the hard work of our volunteers and the generosity of all who made a pledge to UUCville. Secondly, we still need donations for the upcoming spring auction, which will take place on Saturday, May 4th from 3 to 5 p.m. This year's auction will focus on events and services. So consider offering a dinner, a movie, a game night, an adventure, a chore or service you can provide, a special skill or expertise, and so much more, whatever you can think of. From your donations, we will create a catalog and all bidding will be live at the auction, which means you need to join us here on May 4th. The auction is a wonderful opportunity for the whole family to meet others in the church who share your passions, who loves sharing a meal with friends, and who can spark an adventure for your kids to play with other children in our church. The deadline for donations has been extended through tonight, so please complete the auction donation from form located on the church website, uucharlottesville.org. Third, are you looking for a fun way to get involved at UUCville? Haven't had enough fun opportunities. Why not join the usher team? The ushers are the folks who prep the sanctuary on Sunday morning for the service. They are so important and integral to our service. They pass the plate, they collect the offering, and all kinds of other really cool and fun stuff. We would also like to extend a special invitation to families who would like to usher during multi-generational services or other special services like that. So please look and, and contact one of our ushers that are here today. The Long Range Planning Task Force is putting the finishing touches on the first draft of our three-year plan, as you heard from John. Next Sunday after the service, the task force will share the draft during a conversation here in the sanctuary and on Zoom. This will be the first of two opportunities to review the draft plan and provide feedback prior to it coming to a vote at the congregational meeting. So please join us in the social hall after the service for coffee and conversation. Our opening words are by Barbara Peskin. For the beauty of the earth, this spinning blue-green ball, earth, Gaia, mother of everything, we journey gently across your back to come together again, to remember how we can live, to remember who we are, to create how we will be. Earth, our home, the lap in which we live welcomes us. As the Mormon family lights the flame of our chalice this morning, please join me in saying our unison chalice lighting words. <laughs> we gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. And then also with the hand motions, with your 
hand out flat to match. We like this chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is the Church of the Open Minds. This is the Church of the Helping Hands. This is the Church of the Loving Hearts. Let's join in singing the first three verses of number 298, Wake Now Our Senses, My Senses. Please rise and body your spirit. I'd like to invite our children to come down and join Ellie and Kim and myself and all of those who may feel young at heart and just want to come down here. Um, we're going to have a story and then a question. It's okay to come in close, you guys. We've got a picture book here. You can look up at the big screen, but we also have the book right here. So come on in close. We won't bite. So many of you have probably seen that we have a big tree in this sanctuary over here. And we're going to connect that tree with the story that Kim and Ellie are about to tell you. So after you hear the story, there's going to be a question for you to tell you more about why this tree is important to us. The name of the book is Greta Thunberg. Has anybody heard Greta Thunberg? Any of you guys? No? Okay, well, you're going to learn all about her. Greta was a little Swedish girl who learned from her parents to turn off the lights, not to waste water, and never throw out food. Three simple lessons for being kind to nature that most grown-ups haven't quite learned yet. She was very proud of her great-grand-uncle, Svante, a brilliant scientist who, a hundred years before Greta was born, made an alarming discovery. The planet was warming up, and humans were the ones responsible for it. But even though adults have known this for a long time, not much has been done to change it. Every day, millions of tons of toxic gases are thrown into the air. Greta wondered what would be left of the planet when she grew up. At school, she watched a movie about climate change. Most of the students were worried about polar bears losing their homes because of the North Pole melting. 
But once the film was over, everyone forgot about it. Everyone, that is, except Greta. She felt so hopeless about the future that she stopped talking. Doctors said she had selective mutism and Asperger's syndrome, which meant she would only speak and pay attention to what was really important to her. Some may have thought that these were two terrible conditions, but they ended up becoming Greta's greatest superpowers. They helped her to stick to her promise to do everything she could to slow down the planet's warming. Greta started by convincing her parents to give up air travel and stop eating meat. But there were dozens of other little things that she could not that she could that she could do. She knew that she couldn't stand up for something without walking the walk. She had done her homework, but it wasn't enough. To stop global warming, politicians had to do theirs too. One day, instead of going to school, Greta elected to sit quietly in front of the Swedish parliament with a sign. And the sign said, school strike for climate. Not very many people noticed her that first day, but it didn't bother Greta. She kept going with her strike every single Friday. And every time she got there, more and more students joined her. It was time for children to wake up the adults. Soon, all over the world, thousands of students started skipping school to protest outside of their city halls, fighting for the future of the next generation. Inspired by Greta's story, millions of people from Melbourne, Australia to San Francisco, California, flooded the streets in the first world strike against, hung, against global warming. It was the biggest environmental protest ever. She crossed the ocean on a wind and solar powered boat to speak in front of world leaders. Want to tell them what she said? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, <laughs> it's not in the book, but Greta Thunberg, a child, looked at the adult leaders in the world and she said, shame on you. And she told them what she thought they ought to do. In the name of all children, Greta asked people in power to stop making up excuses and start acting before it was too late. What started with just one girl with a handmade sign became a movement that includes us all. Global warming is the greatest challenge humanity will ever face, but little Greta is no longer alone because we're there with her, right? So what do you all do in your houses at home to help the earth? Anybody name anything? Yeah, what? You grow lots of plants. That's good. Yeah. We recycle. We recycle. Also good for the earth. Yes. What else? Compost. Compost. Good. Comp These are great things, you guys. What else? I'm sorry? You don't eat meat, just like Greta and her family. Also really good for the environment, isn't it? Well, these are all fabulous answers. And, and this is why, you guys, this is why we have that tree of hope and commitment over here. Because today, everybody here in the congregation, and hopefully all of you, as soon as your RE is over, you're gonna get a leaf like this, 
and you're going to write down on it your promise to earth for this year. You're going to hang the leaf on the tree. And if you look around at all the people here, we're hoping for one leaf for every person that's in this room. That'll be a pretty tree, right? Yeah. So please, after, after RE, get your parents, come on back in. We'll make sure that there's a leaf here for you so you can write your promise and hang it on that tree. Okay? Sounds good? All right. Um, for those of you who are in the congregation, you will have noticed there are trays or bags in some cases at the end of the pew. Feel free to go ahead and grab a leaf and a pen and pass it down. Um, and meanwhile, we'll sing our children out to out out to their classes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now we're going to have a time for centering and sharing. So everybody just sit back and listen. We have a prayer for climate justice written by Reverend Kelly Dignan. In the presence of the boundless mysteries of the cosmos, we gather in deep gratitude and awe. We give thanks for the unfolding wonders of the natural world, the intricate dance of ecosystems, the resilience of life, and the profound interconnectedness that weaves through the tapestry of our existence. As we marvel at the grandeur of the universe, we humbly recognize our place within this cosmic symphony. Grant us the wisdom to embrace a deep love and reverence for earth, our shared home. May we return to ancient practices of reciprocity and mutuality as we recognize the inherent value of every creature, every ecosystem, and every delicate balance that sustains life. We acknowledge the urgent call for earth care and climate justice. Help us to imagine a future of flourishing for all. Align our actions with the rhythms of nature and the principles of justice. Grant us the courage to confront the challenges of our time with compassion, seeking justice for those most affected by environmental degradation. In this shared journey, may we be guided by love and the sacred energy that unites us all. May we embody the principles of care, gratitude, and a profound love for the intricate web of life. Amen. We are an interconnected community that cares for one another. Part of how we embody this care is by taking time each week to share the joys and sorrows we hold in our hearts. And due to time constraints, we won't be doing our ritual of joys and sorrows this morning. But Angela Orbaugh, which I saw, there she is right at the back. Um, she will be available for a few minutes after the service in the back corner of the sanctuary, if you're in need of pastoral support or just need someone to listen. 
Those worshiping online can contact pastoral care team at pastoral at uucharlottesville.org. This community offers its love and support to what is closest to our hearts. Another way we show our care for one another is in sharing our financial gifts with our community and our congregation. For the month of April, our social action collection will be taken for the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund. Funding abortion is community care and BRAF has been providing financial support to people needing abortions for almost 34 years. And they are still here providing financial and logistical support such as transportation, lodging and other things um, to Virginians and those traveling to Virginia for an abortion. BRAF provides $20,000 each week in abortion funding at a time of, a, of crisis for abortion access since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This is what it looks like to care for each other. Rachel, will you now please show us the social action slide, which I know she has already done because she's on top of everything, for giving for those who would like to make a donation right now. In addition to giving online, if you would like to give today with cash or check, please use the social action collection envelopes here in the sanctuary and place your offering in the collection plate. Please do not seal the envelopes as we reuse them over and over and over again. Along with our social action collections each week, we invite everyone into the spiritual practice of generosity by giving to the ministry of our congregation. Through your pledges and with the weekly Sunday morning offering together, our financial gifts and support sustain our congregation. This is our shared ministry. And now during the music that follows, you may choose to make your Sunday morning offering by using the text address or going to our website. Here in the sanctuary, you may place cash or checks in the collection plate as they are passed. Let us now dedicate all the many gifts we share with one another by saying these words on the screen. We accept your gifts with gratitude. May we use them wisely for the highest good. <laughs>
This morning's reading is by Emily Johnston. It's a constant question for me every time I'm entranced by the beauty of this world. What does it mean to love this place? What does it mean to love anyone or anything in a world whose vanishing is accelerating, perhaps beyond our capacity to save the things we love most? We still have the chance to make the space for hope, to act in such a way that hope might exist for others who come after us. Not everyone can focus on this work. Many people are too full up with difficulties of their daily lives. But if you can, then the world needs you. And it needs you right now. Because anything that we do this year or next is worth 10 of the same thing 10 years from now. trees of green, red roses too, I see them blue for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful skies of blue and clouds of white bright blessed days and dark sacred nights and I think to myself what a wonderful world the colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands saying, how do you do? They're also saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. to myself what a wonderful world yes I think to myself what a wonderful Good morning again. Our topic today is Earth Day, but Earth Day is really a misnomer. It's not Earth Day or Earth Week or Earth Month as they now do. It's Earth every day. We need to love and take care of the Earth every single day. That may sound overwhelming and intimidating, but there are many actions that we can take that will help the earth every day. My personal climate story begins about 10 years ago after I had retired and had time to dip my toes into various volunteer activities. I was living in Canandaigua, which is in upstate New York and a small town. And a UU friend took me to a meeting of local activists where they were working on climate issues. 
That meeting was the beginning of my climate activism, as I quickly realized that no matter what other activities I did, none of them would matter if we didn't make the climate crisis the number one priority. That was the beginning of my involvement with a small but powerful group called Citizens Climate Lobby. CCL is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan volunteer organization that advocates for federal legislation to combat the carbon emissions that are killing us and our planet. Their primary tool is lobbying legislators on both sides of the aisle to influence their priorities. When I first joined, I was totally intimidated by the idea of speaking to legislators, little old me, but CCL taught me that as a citizen and a voter, I have power and I can and should use it for good. Professional lobbyists have money, but we are the voters that can make or break a politician. It's quite a heady epiphany. So the CCL experience in particular and being a climate activist in general has been encouraging, but it has also been discouraging, especially when your congressman turns a deaf ear to your pleas, which had been the case for me personally, both when I lived in upstate New York and now here in Virginia, not mentioning any names. CCL strongly advocates for bipartisanship, and I agree in theory, but in practice, with the current toxic, act, toxic atmosphere in Congress, it's like banging your head against the wall. So what do I do when I get discouraged? I think about these people. Susan B. Anthony, who spent her entire life working for women's right to vote and never got to see it come to fruition, but never gave up. Marshall Saunders, the founder of my climate group, Citizens Climate Lobby, who said, I used to think that the important people were taking care of the important problems. Mm -mm. Preserving a livable world is up to us little people. What we do and do not do really counts. Paul Hawken and his book, Project Drawdown, which details the 100 most substantive solutions to reverse global warming, based on meticulous research by leading scientists and policymakers around the world that are being developed and brought to scale as we speak. Lots of good stuff going on in the world. All the climate heroes that I found listed at a website called climateheroes.org. Check it out. Lots of good people are doing a lot of good things. Sarah Mitiga who's a young woman I know from Rochester, New York, and I admire Sarah very much. She's young enough to be my daughter. She's the mother of two young kids, works a full-time job, and still finds time to lead the Rochester Citizen Climate Lobby chapter. Greta Thunberg, Thunberg, need I say more? And so I think to myself, if they can keep the faith, so can I. And so I encourage everyone to stay positive and stay engaged. You don't have to become a lobbyist, although it is a powerful experience. I've been to Washington with this group a couple of times and it's really an exciting and powerful experience. No matter how much time and how little time, how much or how much little or big time and money you have, there's always some action you can take to move us toward the goal of zero carbon emissions in a sustainable world. There are big actions that you can take, like installing solar panels on your house or buying an electric vehicle. And there are small actions, like using cloth napkins instead of paper napkins, carrying your own water bottle, or writing postcards to encourage people to vote for climate-friendly candidates. It all matters, and it all helps. As a matter of fact, I've been writing these voter postcards for several years, and the experts and the politicians say that they do make a difference. So if anybody's interested in getting on this, getting into this, let me know, talk to me after. And here's one last example that good things are happening. This past Friday, my brother-in-law Kent, who is the chancellor of Syracuse University told me that thanks to my encouraging him that SU, Syracuse University will be net carbon zero by 2032, 10 years ahead of schedule. I don't know how much I had to do with it, but Kent said that to me. <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is. So that's my message today. 
I have power, you have power, you have power. We should all use our power for good. And if you want to read about more positive climate news, make sure you read this month's issue of the Ministry for Earth's newsletter, The Green Scene, which will be coming out soon. It's totally filled with lots of good climate news. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. You give me hope. It is difficult to find and maintain hope about the climate right now. Being overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem is perfectly natural. But as we know with any great movement in history, we must maintain hope in order to carry on. So why am I standing here in front of you now? because I have hope and because I believe that we can make things better, even against the odds. But it is important to be aware of what those odds are and what we're up against. Back in the 1970s, a nonprofit called Keep America Beautiful ran an ad campaign packaged as a public service announcement that involved a buckskin clad Italian actor playing a Native American man paddling through floating litter in a waterway. Factories belch smoke in the background, more litter coats the shore as he pulls his canoe onto it. Those of us who are around might remember this ad. A passing motorist throws a bag of trash out his car window and it lands at the man's feet. A tear runs down his cheek as the announcer says, people start pollution, people can stop it. Those of us who were around in the 1970s certainly remember this ad. It was very impactful. I have a friend who started a campaign as a child to put trash cans in her neighborhood in Cleveland, saying she was influenced by that ad. This was part of a larger campaign to encourage people to don't be a litter bug. Keep America Beautiful was a nonprofit started in 1953 by corporate entities such as can and bottle manufacturers, Coca-Cola, Dixie Cup, and others. These companies knew that if their one-way single-use, non-returnable packaging were going to cause environmental problems, they may be required to stop making that packaging. Vermont had already passed a law against the production of throwaway bottles, and other states were poised to do the same. So the packaging and beverage industries flipped the script, as we say today. Those litter producing companies started an ad campaign to stop consumers from throwing their products on the ground and in streams. So while well-intentioned people were trying to solve the litter problem by stopping the creation of litter, the litter creators were producing ads to make consumers feel responsible for this new abundance of waste. Keep America Beautiful ran successful campaigns for getting litter off the ground and into landfills while simultaneously diverting attention from the very corporations who, who were creating the litter to begin with. We as individuals still hold this responsibility to this day, right? We, each of us, meticulously sort through our packaging that we have left when the product is all used up and what we're going to do with that. Wash it, recycle it, compost it, throw it away. We make those decisions. Municipalities have offered recycling to consumers for decades. At the same time, companies have continued to create and tout the convenience of single-use containers. Think juice pouches, Swiffers, plastic beverage bottles, Ziploc bags, the little green stick that goes snaps into the lid of the Starbucks cup so you won't spill any. All relentlessly, relentlessly created by profit-seeking companies while we're left quite literally holding the bag for how to manage the waste. We have Keep America Beautiful and their anti-litter campaigns to thank for this. Fast forward to the early 2000s, British Petroleum, now known as BP, is the first oil company to acknowledge global warming. 
they start a campaign to get everyone to calculate their household's carbon footprint. Sound familiar? The carbon footprint calculator originated with a company that had an enormous carbon footprint. And their idea really took hold. It's a pretty common household word now, and many people of means know their carbon footprint and are taking measures in their own lives to reduce it. But while consumers are diverted into a maze of calculating our own carbon footprint, BP and other fossil fuel companies keep going on, business as usual. Drilling, fracking, spilling, and saying, what's your carbon footprint? This is not to say that it's bad to know and reduce your carbon footprint. It's good to do that. It's good to know and reduce your carbon footprint. But it's also to say that businesses, and especially fossil fuel companies, should be doing the same. OK, so now I get to the good part. How do I find hope in all of this? Um, I have been a follower, uh, follower of Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She's a marine biologist, a climate activist and expert, and the original host of my favorite podcast, How to Save a Planet. She gave a TED Talk in 2022 called How to Find Joy in Climate Action. It's only 10 minutes, you guys. I recommend looking it up and watching it. In it, she offers up the idea that you don't have to do the exact same thing that your neighbors are doing to help fight climate change. You can do what you love and what you are good at. In other words, you can use your, uni your unique superpowers, like Greta in her little book with her little superpower outfit, um, to fight this fight. Um, this is a Venn diagram that she created um, and, how, and how you personally can come up with your own superpower. First, name the things that you do that give you joy. Second, name the things you are good at doing. Third, find what work needs to be done. The intersection of these three things is where you can make your biggest contribution. This here is where I find the greatest hope. So not just Dr. Johnson's encouragement to use your superpower, but seeing other people from all walks of life doing just that. The people and organizations that Ellie talked about. Ellie, the Green Grannies, uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby, Community Climate Collaborative, Southern Environmental Law Center, Ravana Conservation Alliance, Relief Seaville. These are all organizations and individuals who are doing their part, using their superpowers um, to fight this fight. So if you are reducing and reusing and recycling and going electric and buying into renewable energy and keep, please keep making those individual contributions and think about your superpower. I'll have some of those Venn diagrams out in the social hall. Think about your superpower and how you can help the cause collectively. Keep an eye on big business, especially big energy. Hold them accountable. Vote and tell your friends to vote for candidates who will advocate for the environment. Together, collectively, we are and will continue to make a difference. I wanna close with a really simple quote by Jane Goodall. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Thank you. Well, so much to think about and so much to do. I want to thank Ellie and Kim for their inspiring reflections and for their leadership of our UUC Bill Ministry for the Earth. I know absolutely, because we've had this conversation, that if Reverend Tim were able to be here today, he would be praising the two of you 
for all the energy and creativity that you have brought to a renewed ministry that is building on the wonderful work that was done when this congregation was certified as a green sanctuary over 10 years ago. In a little over six months, you have already forged partnerships with the Ravana Conservation Alliance and Virginia Interfaith Power and Light, led a number of river cleanups, launched the wonderful sustainable eating potlucks that we're going to enjoy today, and engaged in important issue advocacy and invited us to make our voices heard by signing petitions during coffee hour. We are so excited to see where the Ministry for the Earth goes in the future. And if you are not already on their mailing list, please sign up after the service. As this whole service has been about, the climate crisis is the greatest challenge humankind has ever faced. And no person, no faith community, no country can solve it all on their own. The enormity of the crisis can certainly feel overwhelming and even lead to a sense of despair and doom. But we will never heal the damage done to the planet and find our way out of the climate crisis by giving up or giving in. We must maintain hope, as Ellie and Kim have indicated. Hope comes through action. And each and every one of us has to commit to living more sustainably and leaving a lighter footprint on the planet. So, what about you? We invite you to make that commitment today. As I said before, uh, has everybody gotten a leaf? I see lots of head nodding going on, lots of leaves that have been written on, I suspect. And we are going to do the same kind of thing as we do joys and sorrows every single week. So we'll be coming down this center aisle. And if somebody does need a pen and a leaf, then please, can you raise your hand so we can see that now? Ah, okay. Uh, can we get one to Beverly over here? Oh, you have it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll be moving down the forward aisle just like we do during Joys and Sorrows. And we, when you get to the front, please hang your leaf on our tree of hope and commitment. Um, I think Terry, our very tall person, will be there if, in case you want to put one on the upper branches, the upper nodes of the branch. And uh, Kim and Ellie and I will be there to assist also if you need any help. And then please return down the side aisle when you go back to your seats. And those of you at home, we have not forgotten you at all. You can please write your commitment in the chat and Rachel will share them at the conclusion of our ritual. Yes, so she's, she's showing that she's up there and ready. So let's begin now with our ritual procession. Please come forward.
Rachel, do we have any commitments on Zoom? Very cool. Well, look at our tree, folks. Is this not a splendid commitment tree? Hope tree. And now let's rise, if you're able, and sing our closing hymn, number 1064, Blue Boat Home. Please rise as you're able. I'm going to invite Kim to put out the chalice and we, while we do our benediction, as we go forth from this sac sacred space, may we celebrate earth and our shared lives. May we recognize our connections to all that is in and on the earth. May we truly and deeply value the inherent worth of all in this awesome interconnected web of existence. May we commit ourselves to a new way and may we hold our commitments and each other gently yet firmly. Blessed be and amen. Thank you. And we have a pop, the green grannies are going to come up and sing us out. And we invite everyone to come join the potluck and social time. Thanks for coming.
song? The chorus from Three Dog Night, believe it or not. <laughs> and we want you to join us in the chorus. You'll see the, you'll see the verses, but the chorus is just the beginning. Thank you. 